You know, we're on wooden seats in the Lowfields Road stand. A lot of people would still come to the game wearing a jacket, uh, often a tie. Um, people would bring a, a hold all with them with the flask in and the sandwiches. And, you know, this was uh, and the sort of abuse that would get thrown at the players. You know, I remember vividly uh, a guy who sat adjacent to where my father had his seat and where I would sit. Um, if Billy was having a bad game, he would he would call him a bowl of custard. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine now sitting in a football stadium shouting out, come on, you great bowl of custard. But that was his a idea. Bowl a bowl of custard. A bowl of custard was custard. the idea of giving somebody a hard time. So it was kind of a different... A different uh, era, but I remember vividly coming to many games with my father um, and watching what was then obviously the great Revy side. Mm. Um, but amazingly, you know, the, the stadium was not full for every game. There were still some empty seats around, right. which is crazy, really, when you think about it now. You think, how, yeah. how could that happen? If you look at the crowd stats for that era, obviously for the very, very big games, um, the place was absolutely packed to the rafters. But for regulation league games um, that was not always the case and certainly wow. uh, we, I would you know, right, sit there that bloke's not coming this week well you wouldn't get that would you You know, if we were in the Premier League now you know, oh, be no. every seat gone yeah. you wouldn't be saying yeah, well yeah, let's yeah. see who turns up and you can always sit there or whatever um, so that was it was interesting and my first away game I remember going to, to Leeds Road to watch uh, Huddersfield Town versus our team um, and we were obviously in the way end, right at the back of the stand. It was just a stand; there was no roof on it. Um, but as a young kid, I I try to work out. I think I'd be four or five, um, watching football and concentrating for ninety minutes. If you brought your kids to the game, you'll know that this is uh, yeah. this is a bit of a challenge. Um, <laughs> uh, and I remember paying as much attention to the police horses outside the back of the stand as I did to the football going on and getting cracked around the back of the head, saying, "I brought you to watch the football, not to watch some police horses." So. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that. Um, uh, uh, quite quite an, uh, 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 a fun time to to be a Leeds fan as well. Would you, during that Revy time as well, and and that, and that fantastic team. Yeah, and then obviously going on from that. Um, so I grew up watching them in that kind of transition period post Revy. Um, we had a big awards uh, ceremony on uh, Monday night, just gone in Harrogate, the White Rose Awards, uh, eleven hundred people, black tie dinner, huge huge event. Um, celebrating all things great about Yorkshire and one of the uh, guests who was there was Tony Curry who was somebody oh, who course. then of course coming out the back of the Revy uh, era I used to love watching TC play for us I thought it was a great player he was stylish he had panache and for me when he moved on from us that was one of many blows of being a Leeds United fan over the years <laughs> Yeah, there's been there's been a few. Who's your who's your favourite player? Is it Tony Curry your favourite player? Of all no, time? Eddie, Eddie Gray. I would say. I think there's a lot of people that would say. I mean, isn't it when they did the poll? That wasn't too long ago, was it? When they did the poll of the best, and he was wasn't he didn't he come out as like second or third? Yeah, well, I think wasn't he? I, uh, the the Billy Bremner statue, the the you know regenerated that, and you could buy a plaque, mm. and each corner of the the statue they've dedicated to a legend. So there's. Um, there's John Charles, there's mm. obviously Billy's in the centre, uh, Gary Speed and uh, Lucas Radaby, and then the, the fourth one actually is Eddie Gray. And, mm. Um, mm. I mean, Ed, Eddie's an absolute lovely chap. I'll just like, sort of speak to Sir Gary off air um, with the Leeds United LUTV. Mm. I do a lot with Eddie mm. Gray mm. When, when, when I cover yeah, that. He's, and, he's a top bloke. And he's absolute one of the nicest men you'll ever meet. I mean, you know, oh, I, I don't think he's really into music. You've probably never heard a uh, Pigeon Detectives track. <laughs> But it's actually, well, you never know. It's actually given me a lot of advice as well. Like when when one of the first times I ever met Gary, I would do, Gary, uh, um, Eddie, sorry, um, I was doing um, the core commentaries um, with with Eddie and um, Tom Kerwin. Oh yeah, yeah. And and before I went on air, Eddie kind of you know gave me a little bit of advice, and then after it was like, oh well, well done, lad, you, you did really well, you know. Because I think he kind of maybe could sense I was a bit nervous. Yeah. And. Um, an absolute top bloke, and and he's he's a living legend. Oh uh, yeah, Leeds United and. And I'm glad that he's got, uh, you know, a, a corner of the the, the Billy Bremner statue. It's quite funny actually. I was listening to the Talking Shut Leeds United podcast last night, and yeah. they were kind of talking about maybe other statues at Ellen Road, and maybe trying to bring Don Revy a bit closer to the stadium because he's kind of opposite the the East End, isn't he? And they were sort of saying, you know, this idea. Somebody mentioned it, building kind of this like four statues in an area type thing, and 
one of the votes off already, Gray. I and, think so. And Howard Wilkinson as well. I think, think that would be, no, be a good idea, having yeah. a statue of Eddie, wouldn't it, really? Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that would be fun. The other thing I think about Eddie Gray now, when you meet him now, because he's a man like in his 70s, I'm yeah, going to yeah. say, um, uh, he's still fit. Well, he's looked he's after himself, granite. hasn't he? You know, oh, my word. He's looked after himself, so... There's a lesson there for some of us. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly for me, Sir Gary. I know I can see you looking there. <laughs> um, uh, all, all of us, probably. <laughs> um, uh, we're we're going to come on to talk to uh, uh, Sir Gary about uh, what's going to be happening in Yorkshire uh, over the uh, the coming uh, months and for a massive uh, 2019. But uh, first, uh, should we look back um, at uh, the last match for, for, for Leeds United? Yeah. Um, the tri travel to uh, West Brom. Uh, Ryan, let's come to you first. What, what what happened, Ryan? What happened? Bad day at the office, really. Well, I okay. don't know if you saw it, Sir Gary. I mean, I know you're very, very busy at the sure. moment. You've just been saying, but um, four one away defeat. Uh, it's the heaviest defeat we we've had this season, and um, a lot of individual mistakes. Marcelo Bielsa has come out after the game and sort of he's kind of took the blame, which I guess some good managers probably would do, defend the players, but. Yeah, it, it, it were a tough day. I mean, um, Darren Moore, to be fair, the West Brom's manager, I think he got it tactically spot on. Mm. Leeds United play with a lot of possession, they play with a lot of pressing, and what he did is he set up his team to press as high and counter-attack. And the players at West Brom have still got, this, they're, they're arguably still a Premier League team. Um, they've, they've dropped down for Premier League last year, they've still got some quality players. Yeah. And, um, and they, they really hit us where it hurt when, when it comes to counter-attacking. And the, the problem was with the counter-attacking, you had people like, and I'm not blaming him per se, but people like Stuart Dallas were caught out, um, you know, because he was kind of playing right wing back, so they were playing quite high up. And with the fast, how, how quick they counter-attacked us. And it went from bad to worse, really. It was kind of, in the second half, it, we went into the second half nil-nil, and um, they, they got um, a goal in the uh, 53rd minute, I think it was. And... They um they kind of didn't look back really. They kept going at us and going no. at us. They got us by the throat really, and um, we looked shell shocked. And there are too many missed passes, sloppy passes. We never won any second balls. It were not the Leeds United that we've grown to love this season. Let's say that. And um, you know we have it, we it'd be probably one of the most difficult games we'll face. West Brom being on a bad run, they were desperate to get to to get back on 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 the form table really and. We kind of knew that. We knew it was going to be difficult. I mean, we we discussed this last week, and I I said it's going to be a tight, difficult game. I actually went for one 0 Leeds United, but my my head were kind of thinking it's probably going to be one all, really. You know, yeah. that, I don't think we I'm not want sure we were actually going to get a win, but obviously how wrong I was. We 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 got stuff really, and but possession stats were bizarre. Leeds United had seventy percent of possession, seventy thirty it was. So possession doesn't you know doesn't mean you'll win the game if you're seventy percent possession like Leeds had. It's what you do with that possession, and we, we're just not doing enough in the final third. Really, a bit sloppy, a bit, a bit wayward. Um, yeah. I mean, one of one of my my fans' views kind of says <coughs> says um, which one is it? Well, I can't remember. I'll read some out in a bit. But one of them kind of basically, with the reason why I picked it out was basically saying that. He, Leeds United kind of just weren't at the races and they were, they were trying to almost find that perfect goal. Can, can you remember the Invincibles Arsenal um, 10 years ago? Trying to pass it, it into the net. They basically, but they successfully did it because they had Thierry Henry, Patrick Vieira, you know, they, they, could, yeah. they kind of could do that. <laughs> and we were, it, it <laughs> We've got the same to, team that, that uh, Paul Heckenbottom had apart exactly, from Barry yeah. Douglas. And it kind of sometimes seems, seems like we're trying to do that and, and it just fizzles out in the final third. So a really disappointing evening really and, um, and very sobering as well I think um, back to the drawing board for Marcelo Bielsa I mean we're on international break now so um, he's got a good sort of 10 days he'll have with his players to really get them fit again well he'll be making them run like dogs won't he that's what, that's what he does <laughs> I think but, um, he does yeah. did you think I mean this in the championships Gary it is it, it, you're going to get results like this I think it's just such a competitive league that, and in the <clears> style that Leeds are playing this season these sort of results are going uh, are gonna to occur I think well, I hope not um, <laughs> I mean I, I take a slightly different view I think uh, you know we were lucky to be nil nil at half time um, yeah, and true. at that point you'd have thought hang on a minute we need to build a bit of a wall here because otherwise we're going to get taken to the cleaners which is what happened the longer games go on the more they open up we all know that Um and uh, we didn't change anything and of course we got taken to the cleaners in the second mm -hmm. half um, so I think we're going to have to be able to adapt our style of play 
because when we come up against teams like this who are better than us to be honest we've got a fantastic coach but we don't have the very best players yeah. um, and we're not about to go out and buy I suspect the very best players um, so you know it will be about tactics and it will be about attitude and our commitment and all of those good Leeds values yeah. um, but at times we're going to have to be able to be maybe not as flamboyant perhaps not try and go for 70% possession I'd much rather the figures were the other way around of course, but we've got yeah. a 1-1 draw because we'd have taken a 1-1 draw now we're third in the table we put pressure back on ourselves um, and I think it was a you've used the phrase Ryan a bad day at the office I think that's a polite way of describing it it was a crap result <laughs> uh, you know and we didn't do well and yeah. uh, you know if we're going to go up and my view is and we're all desperate for us to go up for goodness sake I mean how long have we been desperate for us to go up for but we're desperate to go up we're only going to go up in the first two we're not going to go up as a playoff side. I've said no. this to the owner, and I've tried to explain it to Mr. Bielsa, that I don't believe we'll go up as a playoff side. It's not in our culture to do that. You can see us getting to a playoff final and again being disappointed with how it all turned out yeah. that the referee was not on our side. You, know, you can write the script now, can't you? So let's, <laughs> so let's not go there. We've all been to too many playoff finals where we come away completely dejected, having planned how we're going to celebrate at the end. Um, and having another four or five hour drive back here feeling absolutely sick as a dog. So let's not go there. If we're going to go up, we've got to go up as champions or not ideally in second place. Mm. But we've got to set the stall out for that. And that means that we can't afford to have these, what you described as, Darren, as bad days at the office, <laughs> um, where, you know, we'll say, well, this kind of thing can happen. No, it can't. No, it can't. If we, if we are a champion, champions going up, uh, into the top flight then we can't say well you know we'll get the odd 4-1 defeat no we won't no we won't we might get the odd 1-1 draw that was a bit of a, an uninspiring thing to watch we'll take that but then we've got to get the other thing for me um, is that I just don't think we're taking the chances that we're getting we're creating, yeah. we're creating shed loads of chances and I did say to some people before the game on um, Saturday <laughs> And I got it completely wrong that, that there will be a game when suddenly we'll get a hat full of goals because all those chances we'll bang them in and we'll get yeah. four or five. Unfortunately, yeah. it was the opposite way around to which we yeah. which we want it to be. But that's what can happen in football. If you go into a, a, a run of consistently not taking chances, you start to regret that. And uh, I do think we've got the right coach. I think he's a great guy. Um, you know, he's a bit of a genius. So mm. uh, respect to Angus and to Andrea for getting us the best coach that we could possibly get to give us the best chance of getting yeah. out of this league. You know, for me, there's only one game in town, which is getting out of this league and getting into the into the league that we should be in. But we've got to understand we don't have a divine right to be winning games. We can't just believe because we're Leeds United that we should be somewhere up at the top of the uh, the Premiership just doesn't work that way we've got to earn that and we've got to get back to putting in proper shifts uh, and and getting there on merit do, do, do you think that maybe um, teams have sort of figured out because of, uh, uh, how Leeds play now they how look, look, play. No, no they're not sort of there's your result 4-1 no. against us the guys it, look what you've got with, with football for me is a live game of chess you know how many pieces you've got on the board you've got 11 pieces on the board for each side and you've got two people who are working the chess set the coaches the managers and it's who can out intellectualize each other and you saw that with Fergie that he was very good at playing chess and basically getting everyone into into a bit of a fuddle and with seven minutes added time every game he'd worked out how they were going to win yeah. and so to me it's the person who can out intellectualize the other guy um, and so far Bielsa has been able to do that unfortunately last Saturday he got completely up against the guy who completely moved the pieces, as you yeah. said, quicker than we could move them around, and that was that. That's why I think at halftime somebody should have gone, if we carry on doing this, we are going to be shown up here, so yeah. we're going to do something completely different, and we're going to completely turn it around, which will, to coin a, a good old Leeds expression, that will um, confuse them up. Yeah, And that's what it's about, isn't it? You know, yeah. uh, We've got to make it very, very unattractive for teams to play against us. That they, when they come here or, or, or when we visit them, they just don't want to play us because they know that we're either going to play this very, very attractive fancy football that leaves them mesmerised or we're going to come and we're going to have, in inverted commas, a good kicking session. And you won't like that. <laughs> and the one, thing, the one thing that I think that O'Leary got right was that, as he said, the team that he created could play in many different ways. If you want to come and have a physical game, that's okay, we can deal with that. Yeah, they had the players for that, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, if you want to have a fancy game, we can do that. 
if you want to have a stylish game and get some cracking goals, we'll deliver that as well. So I think being able to have those different options is vital. Um, so I think it's be fascinating to see what uh, what the coach does now. That there's a little bit of time to regroup. Um, clearly, he's got players away all over the world doing their stuff. But when he gets them back, and hopefully we can start to get players fit again, because you know we need our best players yeah, playing. Some you know, injury. We, we don't have a big enough squad of talented players to have four or five out who actually should be on the pitch. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's the issue, isn't it, Ryan? Is that is yeah. that the the injuries have come? And I, I don't think you can blame the sort of like the intensity of uh, you know how Leeds are playing for, for the injuries, mm. but you know quite a lot of those injuries are, are, have come from sort of like just like that sort of intense play, really. And that's I don't know, right. you've got to. Some people, you just got to like wrap them in cotton wool, like is like it, Pablo. Like, like Pablo, yeah. I mean, a lot of them are muscular injuries, which um, is synonymous with kind of being overexerted, really. So, um, and Bielsa's kind of, you know, it's been publicised that he does, um, you know, make them work hard in training, and and he's been asked it actually by a lot of journalists. He gets asked it quite often when a new injury crisis or new injury hits. They tend to ask him. Um, so, um, you know, so Mr. Bielsa is, is this kind of because your training regimes and and he actually denies it and I kind of like I kind of I don't know I don't see the training uh, when when I uh, when I went to the film premiere of the <coughs> Josh Warrington program uh, film movie he made and um, I was speaking to young Tom Pierce actually uh, who were there and uh, oh yeah yeah and he actually said oh it's crazy he's, he's uh, training but he said I love it you know so um so Tom Pierce kind of you know he's he's only a young lad and he'll be a f- as fit as a fiddle and and you know he's saying it's hard work but but then you get you know uh, Patrick Bamford, who is uh, um, unfortunate in 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 an under twenty threes game, it, yeah, it, it, a bad twist and it's damaged the ligament. I mean that's not nothing to do with training regime, really. That's just unlucky. Yeah, and same with um, Berardi, and that's um, a tendon issue with his hamstring. So it's. <coughs> You know, um, and you wouldn't say that Ailing's thing. injury was due to the training regime. No, that were a, kind of a bit of a <laughs> weird fifty-fifty clash thing, wasn't it? You really? know, yeah, so it so so I don't yeah. buy this. It's the training yeah. regime. I think it's a it's a nice question for journalists who have not got enough imagination to ask other questions to yeah. try and create a bit of a story yeah. around it. I don't. I think it's a non-story. I think. Yeah. Listen, you know. What do we want? Do we want players who are fit and who can wear the shirt with pride, or do we want little podgy ones out there who are just running around getting out of breath? You know, and we think, what's going on here? Well, I mean, some of the players when they come in after after the preseason, you could see in the face that the, the, the weight they've lost and and oh, they were so they fit were so, coming into yeah, coming and, out of preseason, and, and you can see the intensity can go to 85, 90 minutes where that sort of intensity mm. in previous seasons you know you get 60 70 minutes top so tops so it's significantly <laughs> improved that, that aspect of it and, and i like it really it, it kind of means we can well it's proven the fact that you know we were behind at teams like swansea and we kept going and kept going and we got a late equalizer uh, the mm. same the same at uh, ellen road fairly recently um when we scored a, 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 a fellow late goal in 83rd minute, we, we kept going to, to get the equaliser, you know, um, obviously, you know, Roof sort of maybe handballed that one in that particular day, but the, the, the team kept going and kept going. Came off his thigh, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he's... Thigh. We'll, we'll say his thigh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but you're right about the the, the the training. I mean, you look at that pre-season and the, the, I don't know if you call it the Bielsa effect or the training regime he put in because that was a complete... Even though it was the same team that he had at the end of... Heckenbottom had at the end of last season, bar one player that was starting. Whatever Bielsa had done during that summer, he'd turned them into a uh, an amazing unit, hadn't he, Sigari? Well, that's the point about the chess game isn't it you know it's the same pieces that everyone's got is how you how you best use them and how you configure them and I and I think as I say I think the thing about being a Leeds United fan is it's never easy um, you know and so maybe we shouldn't be shocked by last Saturday's result that you know were, were we going to win every game and go up as you know as absolute outstanding yeah. heroes but um, it would be nice if it was just a little bit easier occasionally because I don't know about you but if we like the Saturday's result completely messed up my Saturday night <laughs> you know, it, it does ruin. You know, it, it absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, and uh, and I'm sure a lot of other fans must be able to associate with this. That you know, if the result's great for the weekend, then you you know, you, you, your attitude and mood is completely different to if you're wandering around like you know with a grump on because we've just been mullered. Mm, yeah, exactly. No, I, I totally agree. When Leeds United lose, it um, 
it ruins my my afternoon, evening, and sometimes my whole weekend if it's a. a bad Absolutely. Day. But then you go off and see Bohemian Rhapsody, but and then things are right again. See Bohemian Rhapsody, <laughs> what a great film! If you haven't seen that, everybody go and watch Bohemian Rhapsody. It I agree with that. Film. Brilliant, Absolutely. outstanding. It's yeah. uh, so so good, really really good. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, Josh Warrington's film, Fighting for yes. a City. I yes. think it's coming out on DVD and streaming next week I think it's right, next yeah. week it's coming out as mm-hmm. well and that's uh, that's well worth uh, watching yeah that that's film. fantastic um, I think we, we discussed it a bit more in depth last, last week didn't we yeah. in the podcast but um, yeah Josh great lad fan of the show former guest of the show um, and it's following him and his family and his his way up to, to Ellen Road really um, yeah. to fight uh, Lee Selby so um Great, great viewing and um, a great story to it. Really nice to see uh, him and his dad. His dad trains. Yeah, yeah, nice, absolutely. Um, yeah. Fa- fantastic, really, and um, you know, just an ordinary lad like like us all, Darren. So it's, it's good. I'd one, like to be that ordinary. One, of, one of our own. <laughs> if I could, that would be well. Mar- that would be quite yeah. marvelous, really. I know. Um, uh, uh, so uh, let's just come on to some of your fans' views yep. from the uh, West Bromwich Albion uh, lost. Um, uh, what, 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 what were the fans say? Because when you heard, I've seen lots of clips on social media of some fans um, at the West Brom game, four-one uh, down, and still at the, making more noise than the West Brom fans, well, which I thought was that's spectacular. That's a United thing, really. I mean, yeah, we, what, it, we, we, we were a poor performance. But at the end of the day, I, I, I may, maybe I'm wrong in saying this. Um, maybe we we'll have people commenting on what I'm about to say. But I kind of think we're maybe a little bit overachieving, if I'm being honest with you. Because like like we were saying last year, we it's kind of the same team and we've got this better coach. And when you kind of compare our Leeds United squad to some of the other squads, we, we're not in... We're probably we're probably maybe one of the top six squads, <coughs> so maybe now we've dropped down to sort of third position, which may be about right. But you know, on paper, we're not quite as good as some others. But, and but this season's been amazing so far, in my opinion. So um, it's kind of, I think, the, the Bielsa revolution. I mean, Leeds fans have always been fantastic. We'll always sing, especially the away, the away days are great. You know, um, <coughs> I've, been some, I've been to some fan, none, fantastic away days. I mean, it's <coughs> great bunch of supporters and. <coughs> Yeah, just just um, that's what we do as Leeds fans. You know, um, why sit there and sulk when when we've travelled all the way down to to Birmingham, West Brom, um, and um, why 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 sit there and sulk when we're getting beat four one? Let's have a sing. Let's out sing the crowd. I mean, you listen to you watch on Sky. You're, all you can hear is the Leeds fans. You know, you can't hear the home fans. So um, yeah, it's true. So that's good. But obviously, every every game I put out the fans view on Twitter. And obviously a massive response to this one, and it was quite a big response. As in, there were a lot of a lot of divided opinions. There were a lot of players getting a lot of stick. Um, just a couple of them. Um, a chap called Sarge, beaten on the day by a much better side, stronger, fitter, and more creative. Leeds looked clueless. Taking Douglas off was bizarre. Unfortunately, Dallas and Bailey Peacock Farrell looked out of their depth. Sobering night. Um, Lewis Eddy. Simply not good enough today. Too many stray passes, caught napping with the ball, individual mistakes, and Defo need to find cover at right back until Ailing returns. And finally, uh, Johnny Mitchell. Um, we wasn't brave enough in the final third. Too much messing around trying to find the perfect goal. This led to their counter attack for the first goal. Bailey Peacock Farrell not good enough, but neither were some of the others. Bad day at the office. Here uh, we go again. And I kind of left that one to last, Johnny's because. Well, Jonas and Lewis is the both kind of called out the goalkeeper. Now we're not one Darren to sort of get at players individually, but there has been a few mistakes this this season. And um, our friends over at Talking Shop Podcast they run a poll, and I said to them, "I'm going to steal their poll for my podcast," and <laughs> they give me their blessing. And um, their poll on Twitter got quite a lot of um, fans interacting actually. And their poll was, "Should Jamal Blackman?" Get a call. Oh, yeah. Up. Jamal Blackman, yeah, I saw of that. course, being our, res- our reserve goalkeeper, played all last season at Sheffield United. Sheffield United fans really high- highly regard him, so he's, he's experienced in the championship. And the poll had s- several hundred um, people um, interacting with it, and it was 70 30 to yes, Jamal Blackman should get a chance. So, um, I'm quite interested to know what other fans are thinking. You know, people on Facebook, Twitter, you know, contact us now. We'll, we'll have a chat. Um, so, Gary, I, I, any opinions on goalkeeping situation at, at Leeds United? I think you've got to leave it to the coach. Yeah. I think, you know, it's great having I mean, 40,000 managers in the stadium or 35,000 managers in the stadium every week when we're at home. Um, but the reason we've got a top coach is that he is a top coach. That's his job and he will know what to do. And I think, you know, 
the one thing about the lad who's in between the sticks at the moment, what he doesn't need is loads of people getting yeah. on his back who are supposed mm. to be his supporters saying, well, we think you're not quite up to it, son, because it's going to get into his head and it's going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think we should say to him, we think you're a top bloke. You know, we all make mistakes. The main thing is to learn from them and to crack on and do good things. If you remember, we had Casper Michael here as a bloody goalkeeper. We didn't did, we? yeah. And yeah, I thought it was absolutely average for us. And then he went on and he won the, won the, won the, <laughs> the, won, Premier, won the Premier League. So, you know... Stranger things can happen, so you know. Let's get behind the lad. Let's see what yeah. he can do, and 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 if the coach wants to make a change, then we'll then we'll back him. But you know, uh, I think you've got to get behind the coach and say, look, you know, he is he he is our best chance of getting out of this league as things stand at the moment. You know, we don't have somebody who's going to put two or three billion quid into uh, you know go and buy every player up that yeah. you want. And even then, we've seen that there's no guarantee that that can get you to where you want to get exactly. to. Exactly. Yeah. So you know, let's not be be fooled by believing that somebody who's just going to splash lots of cash is going to is going to sort it out. Our best chance of getting out of this league has to be with the coach that we've got. Um, the players that we've got clearly can win lots of games. I'm not quite in the same position where Ryan is. We're saying, well, maybe we should settle for being in the top six because that's where the squad is. We're Leeds United. You know, when you put the shirt on, you're expected to play 20% better than you would for any any other club. The fact we've got the best coach, uh, certainly one of the best coaches in Europe at the club, um, gives us our very, very best chance of getting out of it. And we've been through these these positions before when we had these really top coaches working with us, like Jock Steen and others. We've got to seize those moments and we can see the difference it makes to the team. Because to, to your valid point, it's the same players and yet they're playing so much better, mm. which proves that it can be done. Uh, I think there was a lot. There, there was a lot of raised eyebrows when, uh, and we've sort of discussed this uh, uh, before on the podcast when uh, it was announced that Marcelo Bielsa mm. was going to be uh, the Leeds United head coach. I think for for a lot of people, they were like, "I've not heard of Marcelo Bielsa," um, but uh, you know, it was obvious that you know, in in the, in the football environment, uh, this guy is seen as a, as a bit of a legend. And, and you well, he's coached quite a bit in Europe, and I got a lot of messages from my friends in France who we know through sport, obviously, who said, you're going to love this. You're going to have a great ride with this guy. You're going to play some fantastic football and he will be a star for you. Yeah. Now, I didn't have any knowledge previously on the guy. He's no. obviously then looked him yeah. up and so on. Um, I've met him a couple of times. He's a very, very nice guy. Um, clearly, he has a tremendous footballing brain on him. Um, and uh, maybe, as you said at the start, Darren, the stars are aligned. Centenary year, you know, Etc. 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 Yeah, we've just got to get out of this division. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that, that that is the key to it. It's just getting out of there. I, and and we'll, we'll come on to discuss, uh, uh, you know, January uh, and uh, what what they're going to need to do yeah. uh, in in January. Uh, so Gary, let's let, let's talk about uh, uh, 2019. Before we do, I, I wanted to talk to you. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you. Um, because uh, if you hadn't brought the Le Grand Depart uh, to uh, Yorkshire, then the Tour de Yorkshire probably wouldn't have uh, become a thing. Correct. As, uh, as big as it was. And that meant uh, that uh, Proper Sport wouldn't have won the IRN Award for the best sports coverage for the Tour de Yorkshire 2017. So thank you very much. <laughs> Happy to be of service. It's, it's an absolute <laughs> pleasure. So no, but thank you very much. Uh, because I think a lot of people uh, 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 maybe uh, thought... <sighs> You know, it's a cycling competition, the Tour de France. What, why, why would we need it? How did it come about that the Tour de France? I know you had a good relationship with Christian Prudhomme from Air. So, um, uh, how did it all come about that Le Grand de Parc came to Yorkshire? Well, very simple, really. Uh, I wanted a big event to put Yorkshire on the map once and for all. I was getting fed up about people talking about Manchester and uh, and uh, obviously London with the uh, London 2012 Olympics. Um, and I wanted a big event to put Yorkshire on the map. So, back in 2010, we started started thinking about what that could be and we had the idea of of the Tour de France it's the it's the largest annual sporting event in the world it's the third biggest sporting event on the planet um I thought well if we could start that here that would that would be ideal the biggest event is in the world is the Olympics I don't think we're going to get that in Yorkshire anytime soon the next biggest event in the world is the FIFA World Cup again similar comment would apply so why don't we go for the third biggest one which is the Tour de France we then started talking to the organisers in Paris who'd never heard of Yorkshire. Um, okay. <laughs> you know, uh, the only thing they'd heard of was the Yorkshire Terrier dog. Right. And the Yorkshire Terrier dog is the most popular small dog in France. Anybody who's anybody's right. got at least one Yorkshire Terrier, and often they have a couple that. of them. Yeah. So great, we're known for a dog, <laughs> uh, and it's not even a very under pudding possibly. <laughs> well, no, they never heard of those. Oh, right. um, and I did try them with. Uh, 
I tried them with everything as to, you know, we heard of the Brontes, David Hockney. I thought we'll go on the football. So Eric Cantona. They said, oh yeah, Manchester United. No, no, it was with us first. <laughs> um, so we tried all all things. And uh, anyway, they came to visit Yorkshire in May 2012. Um, fell in love with the place, thought that, that it might just work. Um, and we signed a contract with them um, November um, 2012. So six years ago to wow. start the Tour de France here just over for four years ago. And then we said that part of our pitch for that is we'd have a top uh, international uh, bike race every year for men and women, the Tour de Yorkshire, obviously come out of that. And we'd have the uh, Yorkshire Bank bike libraries. Um, there's now over 50 of those around the county where people can donate the bikes that their kids have outgrown to these not-for-profit bike libraries, uh, which get fettled up and then loaned out to kids whose parents or parents can't afford to buy them a bike. There's one just up the road from here. Um, last year, 57,000 children in Yorkshire got the opportunity to ride a bike through that scheme who otherwise wouldn't have done so. Oh, that's fantastic. It is. Uh, yeah. So next time you're scheme. stuck behind a couple of cyclists grumbling, just bear that in mind and think, you know, maybe there's a bigger picture here. <laughs> yeah, so, the, sure. so the Tour de Yorkshire was, was all part of the plan right at the very beginning of Absolutely. when you were putting the deal together for Tour de France. Yeah, yeah. You know, we the pitch document that we had um, covered all of that in there to say, you know, this is this is what we will do. This isn't just going to be a flash in the pan. We're going to make sure that we are we are going to try and become the European capital of cycling, and that was all part of that vision. Well, and, and you're quite right because I mean, uh, in interviews I've done in recent years with Christian Prudhomme from from ASO, who, who run the Tour de France, for anybody that don't know. Um, uh, he said that the Yorkshire people are the new Belgians uh, mm. because we've sort of taken on cycling. Were you always a cycling fan? Were you always a cyclist yourself, or have you got have you got into it si since uh, Le Grand Depart? Yeah, no. I mean, my my cycling pre sort of getting the Grand Depart to come here was limited to a, a licensed Fitzgerald's annual charity bike ride. You know, taking in fourteen pubs from one end of Wednesdale to the other. So uh, I don't think that can count as a proper cyclist. But I love it now, and I get out as often as I can. Um, so I've always had a love of sport, whether it's supporting, obviously, Leeds United or Leeds RL, now the Leeds Rhinos, so, and uh, Yorkshire cricket as well. So that's something that we were all brought up on and, you know, sign of in your blood, really, isn't it? Yeah, mm. exactly. And that and that first tour to Yorkshire, um, uh, standing on the uh, the start line at Bridlington on that on that first uh, for I remember uh, I remember it vividly because it was it was such a beautiful day. I remember talking to you <laughs> and talking to Christian Prudham, and there, there was some, there was some Elvises around um, uh, doing some bits and pieces. There was oh, the Lord I, 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 There's a really interesting story around that. So um, we started, as you know, at the outside the spa complex in Bridlington, the very first tour to Yorkshire. Sunny morning, blue sky, sunshine. And that weekend, there was an Elvis impersonators convention on in uh, Bridlington, as you do. <laughs> Apologies to any Elvis impersonators who are listening. <laughs> so 600 Elvis impersonators from all around the country having their annual convention to discuss whatever you discuss if you're an Elvis impersonator. So I thought this is brilliant. So I said, right, what I want on the start line Let's get uh, 70 or 80 Elvis impersonators on bikes. What a great picture that would look. And so the request went out to the organiser of the Elvis impersonators convention. Can we have a load of Elvis impersonators on bikes? Came back. They're a bit shy. They don't like to be uh, photographed that much. I'm sorry. What? I don't get that. <laughs> I don't get that. If, if, if you are an Elvis impersonator, don't tell me that you're introverted and you don't yeah. like the limelight. You know? yeah. I just don't get that. That's a, that's a strange one, isn't it? That is we, we managed one. to persuade three of them to do it. Wow. wow. <laughs> and that was a bit of a... A bit of a stretch, so yeah, yeah, yeah. prizes and surprises all the time. So, uh, d definitely, I, and I, I just remember just the, the the fantastic atmosphere there was uh, in Bridlington that and and that whole weekend. And you and you must have because obviously, sort of transferring what happened in Le, Le Grand Depart to uh, you know sort of an unknown race. It was sort of you know how successful would it be, but it. It turned out to be uh, obviously extremely successful. Um, for, We're for now the fourth. The Tour de Yorkshire is the fourth biggest bike race in the world <laughs> by social media, right. which you know wow. from a standing start, you That's know, so is yeah. Is, uh, yeah. is remarkable, really. So full credit to all of the team who've been involved in putting that together. And it's a big team because it's not just our team at Welcome to Yorkshire and ASO. It's the local authorities, the police, the volunteers, you know, everybody, the spectators who come out and <coughs> animate the towns and villages put up the yellow bikes, the blue bikes, the bunting, the flags and all that sort of stuff all the time. So 
not too much of that around at the moment but by the time we get to april um we're announcing the full routes for next year's tour de yorkshire on the 7th of december right um civic hall in leeds um so that day through all your usual media channels you'll be able to find out where the race is going next year is it coming through your town or your village and the places that we've announced as, as hosts will they be starts or finishes uh, mm. I've, there's a couple I could maybe guess that would be finishes. Um, you can try. Scarborough. It's a possibility. It's definitely. A possibility. It, I mean, but but I mean, because I think you've, three out of four years has been, it's been and it's it's been a fantastic. Four place. out of four years. Four out of four years. So maybe five out of five. Yeah. You never know. Uh, but it is. A, it's a, an iconic finish in cycling. It's now it's wonderful. You know that North it? Bay is just iconic for you know those television images um, on a. On an evening when the race finishes in Scarborough, there looks yeah. amazing. So uh, we'll find out on the seventh of December whether it's a yet another finish. <laughs> I thought we might get an exclusive there, but we didn't. Which, which was which was your other one that you thought might be a finish? Uh, Doncaster, right? <laughs> <laughs> I only, but but if you sort of flip it around and maybe do the start in Doncaster, then that could be quite interesting because I think it's only only finished in Doncaster in a, it has. a couple of years. I yeah, think, correct. I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, but it's again a good finish there where it comes in it's got like it's that a great lo- finish it? I mean it's a really really good finish uh, for sprinters it's a perfect finish yeah. but uh, you know could be a start and in uh, September next year it's going to be a start for one of the UCI races so uh, you know maybe there's a clue there okay mm-hmm. All right. yeah. okay we'll put two, two together come up with five <laughs> um, uh, uh, is it difficult to sort of decide on host towns and and, and where you're going to go because of course I would imagine a lot of town a lot of towns w- would want the Tour de Yorkshire to to be starting or finishing it and it must be difficult for you to decide where you're going to go well uh, that's our job is to uh, you know put the pieces together and uh, decide how to configure them and what works well with what. Um, there's lots of things to take into account when you're deciding that. You don't just simply go, well, let's just put those together and, and have done with it. It's what works from a sporting point of view, what works from a visual point of view, from a logistics point of view. So where we're doing the women's race on the same day as the men's race, yeah, we've got to be able to get back. If we do the women's race in the morning, we've got to get able to get back from the end of the women's race, back to the start, with all the kit and kiboodle, so 39 police bikes, 40 or 50 cars that go with the race, motorbike, camera bikes, and so on and so on, get all that kit back to the start, ready to go again that afternoon. And we've generally got about an hour, hour and a half maximum turnaround. So in that time, we've got to fill everything up back up with fuel, uh, give everybody a chance to have a Mars bar and a bottle of water. um, (laughs) Or a mug shot. Or whatever. (laughs) And then go again. So, you know, it's... uh, it's putting all of that together and then clearly you want the race to build into a climax mm. over the over the duration of the stages so what you don't want to do is make the mistake we did in the first year of having a really brutal stage on stage one and then the winner was all nailed and the rest of it was a bit of a procession through to the finish line <laughs> so, we, so we build to a climax so I think this year's edition just gone was for me a pretty perfect edition yeah um, I think the routes were were fantastic um, and, and culminating in that final day with a with a start at the Peace Hall in Halifax that was that was, that spectacular was totally start. totally spectacular and then a really really tough stage you know going through many great towns and villages and some great iconic climbs Park Rash um, and others as well and then coming up to the big finish in Leeds on the Hedrow which was just like the Tour de France all over again I mean the yeah. crowd on the Hedrow um, for the finish of this year's race was just bonkers. It was bonkers. Mm. I, I, I must admit, because the um, uh, the sort of the amateur race, the sportive, the Maserati yeah. sportive, which is uh, my wife's taken part in for the last two years, mm. um, and to, to for her to finish on the hedgerow, I mean, I've never seen her smile as much uh, certainly when she's been with me uh, but I've never I've never seen her so happy coming down the hedgerow and everybody cheering her because it was a it was a great crowd for, for that as well and that's just an amazing thing for sort of the amateur cyclists and you just see all shapes and sizes of people getting on their bikes going in and getting involved in the uh, the Maserati Sportif and it's a great thing to get involved with that. well I think the thing about the Sportif um, is, is the point that you've just made yes you get to cycle great routes but you could go out today on your bike if you wanted and cycle great routes yeah. or any day there's nothing stopping you doing that but what you don't get is all of the support around it and the organization that, that is the same you're getting for a professional bike race and particularly getting to cross the finish line with tens and tens of thousands of people there 
screaming for you to you know, how crazy is that yeah. it is it is absolutely spectacular there's no doubt about that i wanted to you touched on the women's race and i think that's something that's 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 really evolved since uh the the first year where it was almost just like a uh, a road race circuit um and that's that's become um as important as, as the men's race now and it, it it's it's fantastic to see that yeah i mean for us you know, we said it, it would be completely wrong not to try and do the very best that we can do for women's cycling, to try and push back the boundaries and to prod and poke other race organisers and other people in sport to shame them into trying to do better so we've got better gender equality. Um, as, a, as a single parent of a now 15-year-old daughter, I feel duty-bound to be one of Yorkshire's most vociferous feminists. Um, so... You know, we've we've I think we've done more for women's cycling, or certainly as much as anybody else has ever done. Uh, you know, we pay more prize money for the women than we do for the men. We have live television coverage from start to finish for the women's race as we do for the men's race. We're the only organizer in the world to do that, as well as giving them the same parkours as the men. So they go on the same course as the men, the same starts, the same finish, the same intermediate sprints, the same climbs. Um, so there's nobody else does that you know and so i'm really pleased with what we're doing to have the two-day race for the women we get people who don't understand about the cycling and the organizing we say well why can't you have four days well if you think about it logically just think about what you've just said there so the yeah. final day that we just described which is the day coming into leeds for example that we had last year 185 <coughs> kilometers long um five hours on the bike for the men you know you couldn't do that stage for the women. Under UCI rules, you can have a maximum of 140 kilometer stage. So immediately you couldn't go to the same starts, finish and all the rest of it. Um, and you would probably have to start the women's race if you wanted to do that the same day at about half past four in the morning. Yeah. Well, how's that going to help gender equality? No, no. You know, it's not at all. So, so get with the program, understand the exam question before you try and answer it, which is why I made the point earlier that I think, you know, Technical decisions need to be made by the coach, not somebody who's a sort of would want to be coach. Mm. You know, I like music, but I wouldn't try and tell you how to write a song. Yeah. You know what I mean? I <laughs> yeah. think that's what you're good at. I don't, yeah. I, you know, I'd rather listen to it. Yeah. Um, so let people do the jobs that they're really good at doing, and let's get behind them and support them. And so, uh, really happy with what we've done with the women cycling. Yeah. Um, and I think next year's edition will announce some more innovation around that on the seventh of December. Will be even bigger. Fantastic. Excited about that, um, and of course, it's not just the Tour de Yorkshire next year. Um, we've got the uh, UCI Road World Championships next year happening uh, between the 21st and the 29th of September. Um, that, I mean, Tour de Yorkshire is one thing; Road World Championships uh, is is another level as well. And uh, a, a fantastic coup to be able to get that to Yorkshire. Well, we're we're very happy to be a part of the the uh, the bidding process for that, and to have to have helped get that over the line. And to be able to help to deliver what will be, I believe, the biggest road world championships ever in the history of the sport. It was last here in 1982 in Goodwood, just going around the circuit in Goodwood. So wow. does, does that really count as a proper world championships in the same way that we're going to put a world championships on? Of course it does in terms of the winners and all that sort of sure. stuff. But in terms of the crowds and the range of routes, um, very, very tough. We had a, a meeting uh, yesterday with uh, some of our uh, cycling uh, partners from France who had been round the circuit in Harrogate and said it's a very, very tough circuit. If you look at it on paper, you think, oh, it's straightforward. It is not straightforward. There's a lot of twists and turns, a lot of sharp descents and sharp inclines, some of them coming from a standing start. So going up Parliament Street, as we did with the Tour de France and we've done before with the Tour de Yorkshire, mm. you don't come sweeping in down Ripon Road. You're coming round from the Valley Garden, so you've got to do a 90 right at the bottom of the hill. Yeah, so you'll lose right. all pace there before you've then got to get up the ramp, mm. which immediately change the dynam changes the dynamics of the race. So a very, very tough and technical circuit, 14.1 kilometres around Harrogate. And your only opportunity as a professional cyclist, so any pro cyclist listening to this, pay, pay attention. Attention. <laughs> uh, as, a, as a man or a woman cyclist, your only opportunity to cycle that circuit before the World Championships next year is in the Tour de Yorkshire. Because, as you know, the circuit is against the flow of the one-way system. So if you think, if you think right. you're just yeah, going to yeah. turn up and just cycle at any time, you're going to wow. be cycling yeah. into three lanes of oncoming traffic, so that ain't going to work very well. No. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that, that, that gives us a big opportunity with the Tour de Yorkshire to get people to come and obviously ride the circuit. Uh, and then, obviously, as you say, in September, all, all eyes will be on Yorkshire. 
next um, next September. Yeah, there certainly will be, and yeah. and there's a, there's a lot of hope as well. And I've spoken to Lizzie Dagenham recently that mm. she's uh, extreme. What well, one uh, so excited that it's going to be on her home turf, uh, the Real World Championship, and obviously uh, she's going to be a, a new mum by that point as uh, as well. So she'll be. Uh, um, I, I, well, she's keen to get back, definitely. Yeah, and you know I, I, we all keep our fingers crossed and hope that she can come back you know very very fit and um and i i i think she's got a potentially great opportunity um to be the world champion in yorkshire um don't want to sort of jinx that or or, or anything or anything like that by sort of uh, calling that one because we thought we thought we called it right by saying that Cav would win stage one of the Tour de France in 2014, and then he decided to fall off outside Betty's. Um, <laughs> so, Betty's. so, fall off outside as, as you do, <laughs> as you do. That's just in the queue. But I, yeah. I, I, I hope she can do it. I think she can do it. Um, I know that she's very, very enthusiastic about it. So let's uh, let's keep our fingers crossed and and wish her all the best. That would be great to have. Uh, uh, not just a, a British winner in the World Championships, but a Yorkshire winner as well. Yeah, that was spectacular. A few uh, comments that we've got coming in. Uh, Kev says, uh, congratulations to Gary Verity on his achievements for Yorkshire. He is Mr. Yorkshire. Uh, <laughs> should be very proud of having him, uh, him as our ambassador. Uh, any chance of him getting involved with uh, Leeds United in the future? <laughs> well, uh, I'm too old to play. Um, I was, never say never Sir I Gary. used to be very quick over two yards so that would have been my uh, <laughs> my only contribution to the team uh, but I think Andrea is uh, is a top man I think he's done a great job for the club um, we seem to have somehow been able to attract a procession of uh, interesting previous owners um, very interesting some of them that's very yeah. b- very well put I think yeah. Sir Gary conscious that any lawyers who may be able to listen to this will be <laughs> um, um, but thankfully now, I think we've got a, a great owner who uh, I have a lot of time for. Um, I think he's, he's hired a great MD in Angus. That's a great hire. And I think the hiring uh, Mr. Bielsa is is a, hopefully a stroke of genius. So, so you know, and they've got my full support. And, uh, you know, wouldn't it be great to come back here next year in the top flight? Or, or for me, doing the day job, which is all the tourism stuff for Yorkshire, the welcome to Yorkshire, the... The thing that would make my job um, easier would be European football being played here. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, for me, the dream thing is on a Wednesday night, teams coming here with names we can't pronounce from places that we're not exactly sure where they are, uh, full of players that we can't pronounce the names either. Tick, 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 tick. Brilliant. European football on the box, bringing all the European fans here, filling the city on a Wednesday night. How good would that be again? Yeah. And you remember those nights when you used to come to them? I mean, those are, those are special nights, nights yeah. aren't they? The Champions you know. League nights in particular are absolutely special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. it's just amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think we all uh, all agree with that one. That would be uh, 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 absolutely fantastic. Uh, uh, Jill says, uh, uh, "Morning, Sir Gary. Uh, thank you for all you've done for Yorkshire and cycling. I grew up in the cycling world, and this means a lot to her." So uh, the tour of Yorkshire. And she also says, "I think the Belgians are the new English." <laughs> <laughs> I'll mention that to them later today. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, we, obviously, it's international break coming up now. The mm. January transfer window is going to be upon us uh, uh, before before we know it. Um, w- what do you think uh, Leeds United need to do in, in the January transfer window? Do you think that, that, that there's a few players they need just to bolster them for the, the the final push? Well, probably. The problem is, of course, when you get three fans together like this talking about it, we start off by saying, well, we'll get a really, let's get a really, really good striker. Yeah. Uh, and then let's get somebody really creative for the midfield. In fact, let's get two of those. Um, in fact, throw a goalkeeper in and let's get three or four defenders. And before we know it, we've signed a new team. Um so you know you can uh, you can come up with ideas as, as uh, it's famously difficult it's the January transfer window anyway of course, you, know, you know it's, you it's know. a very problem difficult. isn't it yeah it's very difficult I mean um, but I think we've got to have confidence in what we've got we've got some good players let's get everybody fit we've got a great coach uh, you know and if we'd have won four one last Saturday, we'd be having a, a different, different type sorry. of conversation now, wouldn't we? Go, yeah, you know. There's always a who needs to reaction. sign anybody? Yeah. Who needs to sign? You know. Yeah, we don't need anybody at <laughs> yeah, all. Yeah, if we've just won four one. I always remember last season when we played Burton Albion, Allen Road. We just lost Chris Wood, who Chris Wood the previous season scored thirty goals for Leeds United. 
And Pierre Michel Lasaga came on <coughs> one of his debuts at Ellen Road, scored two goals, and all the Leeds fans saying, "Who needs Chris Wood?" Well, we really did need him by the end of last season. So um, mm, the yeah. Lasaga tailed off, and Leeds couldn't couldn't buy a goal towards the end of the season. So God, I've forgotten yeah, about Lasaga. Yeah, he's doing well. He's back, gone back to Hamburg, but Hamburg are now in the Bundesliga two, so the second tier of German football, and he's he's tearing it up, but. Course. The second tier of German football is nowhere near as difficult as second tier of English football. No, um, it's uh, interesting though, isn't it? Yeah. You know, one of one of life's great riddles is how many players have been and gone from here and then gone on to other places, and we thought they were donkeys, and suddenly they become heroes elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. You know, that is one of that is one yeah. of life's great riddles. I think it's a legionized way that it's it does seem to bizarre. happen, and it seems to happen a lot as well when you look <laughs> when you look back at players. <laughs> Um, and not just like you, you, you counted out because he was great while he, uh, yeah. while he was here as well. But um, how's Grot doing? Because I think he's doing all right as well, isn't yeah, he? We Bless sent him, him. on to loan to, to, I don't know how you pronounce it, but VVV Venlo, um, <coughs> a, a second, tier, second tier Dutch team. And yeah. he's just been called up to the under 23s um, Holland team. So he's obviously doing quite well. There's another one. Yeah. Bless him. Oh, we don't he right. couldn't. Uh, Cow's backside with the banjo <laughs> last year for us, but unfortunately, I he, I, he, I he, he needed developing. He's really yeah, he was he quite lonely as well when he was and over it. And it's the same thing with the young goalkeeper Bailey Peacock Farrell. He's a young lad, so it's difficult yeah. for us to get on his back. Um, <clears throat> we like to have an open forum here, so I, I never try and get on a player's back, but I'll speak an opinion what, where I see it. So, um, but like you said to Gary, and, and this is kind of a phrase we use every week, is in Bielsa we trust. And that's exactly what, if Bielsa deems Bailey Peacock Farrell good enough, then I'm behind him all the way because he's the, he's the man. Um, I think he is key over kind of any player, really. You know, if it were a choice of get rid of Bielsa and bring in two quality players, I'd be like, don't be daft. I'd rather keep the players we've got and have Bielsa getting 120% out of them. Whereas last year, the managers couldn't even get 80% out of them. So, you know, th that's making a huge difference in, in that respect. Like I say, it's the same team. And, and, you know, last season, what, we finished what were it, 13th or something or whatever it were in the end. So, um, you know, there's a significant improvement improvement for that. International breaks come at the right time. I think, I think yeah. I think. I hate to say this. Oh, Probably. We needed it and all that sort of business. But I think... Um, a lot of food for thought for Bielsa. Bielsa's yeah. never, he's never managed in England, so it's, this is a whole new experience to me. He's managed in South America, in in, in Spain, in, in France. You know, he's he's done a lot of work around the world, but I think the English leagues and in particular Championship will be different to anything he's ever done before. So he's you know he's not a young chap, but he'd arguably say he's still learning as well in that respect. So he'll he'll have learned a, a bit of a harsh lesson last Saturday night. Um, and, and I think you know when everyone was getting carried away earlier in the season saying you know aren't we marvellous this that and the other for me the test will be in February when it's sleeting here yeah. and it's horrible weather a cold Tuesday night. exactly you know <laughs> how is all this fancy football going to work then hopefully you know etc uh, etc et that's the real test of it you know? Yeah. you know it's all very when the weather's gorgeous at the end of summer and everyone's you know thinking they're playing beach football yeah. that's fantastic <laughs> let's you know wait 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 till this pitch starts to cut up and it's a horrible horrible night you know yeah. the one thing about sitting in that east stand if you sit up at the top you've got a perfect view of Morley Town Hall right. on a clear day <laughs> On a clear and when it starts snowing and sleeting, it's coming straight into you. You know, yeah, there's no other yeah. stand protecting you. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, there's no, uh, no doubt about that. Um, uh, what, what's what's next for you? Obviously, a uh, busy, busy time now. Up, at, well, I suppose right the way through till tour to Yorkshire. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so the, I'm really proud to lead a, an amazing team at Welcome to Yorkshire. That we've got some of the most talented and enthusiastic people you could ever meet, who are committed to doing their best for Yorkshire you know everyone does it because it's a, it's a mission not a job um, nobody's in it particularly for the money um, and uh, you know it's it's a great honour to work for the greatest county in the world to promote the greatest county in the world uh, and to work with such a such a great team um, but the one thing is we are always absolutely maxed out um, you know we never sit there thinking well what could we really do to you know spend a bit more of our time doing yeah. something different we're full on full gas all of the time and so uh, we're flat out now through to Christmas we take a break over uh, Christmas New Year uh, and then we're back again and it starts early on in January and we're, we're, we're flat out then we're working hard to bring the start of the Vuelta here the Grand Tour of Spain um, um, so you may have seen our four 
uh, BMW X3s that are sponsored by Global, the same mm-hmm. sponsor as the, as the football club, um, with the giant Ys on the roof that are basically doing the rounds. They're in the Lord Mayor's Parade in uh, London on Saturday. Um, they're back up here now, and they'll be at various events and, and things throughout the uh, the months ahead. They'll be out at the Vuelta in the publicity caravan there. They'll be back out at the Tour de France next year in the publicity caravan there. They'll be in Belgium for the Spring Classics. Um, so promoting the Tour de Yorkshire, promoting Yorkshire, promoting the UCI Road World Championships as well here next year. And um, we need to get the start of the Tour de France back here. Yes, that would be fantastic. To, is, is there a good chance that the Grand Park could come back? Does it come back to places? Can do. Yeah, that's been uh, back to a number yeah. of places. That would brilliant. be fabulous, wouldn't it? Really, that, that would, back. yeah, yeah, that would be great. I mean, just lit up, well, lit up the city, really. You know, and um, that 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 start outside of um, Leeds Town Hall and the city were fabulous. Yeah, that day. <laughs> and the whole county. You know, obviously after it, you oh, know, it so had good. a really good day. <laughs> that day. <laughs> had a few few drinks with some good friends, <laughs> and the city was buzzing you know yeah uh, really good atmosphere uh, a couple of bits of housekeeping um we had a competition uh, last week uh for two tickets uh, to go and see uh, a couple of pairs of tickets actually to go and see uh gordon strachan in return of the strack return of the strack not sure about that name <laughs> uh, november 16th uh which is at victoria hall in keithley well done uh, to daniel hopwood on twitter is daniel underscore hopwood and callum o'neill on twitter at callum o'neill, o'neill 44. 44 yeah that's <laughs> All right, I can read that now. Um, it's uh, Victoria Hall and Keefley. It's on, on November 16th. Congratulations, mate. Uh, you've won a pair of tickets each to go and see uh, the legendary Gordon Strachan. And if you want to get tickets, uh, then further information available at mjksportsevents.co.uk and you can uh, book a ticket on 07414-960-956. Uh, we won't be back next week because it's nope. international break. International break uh, for so us So we'll have well. a little uh, f- uh, feet mm-hmm. up next week. Yeah. Um, uh, last week tweet coming through uh, from uh, Gareth he says uh, has Sir Gary ever thought against the against the odd story of bringing the Grand Depart to Yorkshire could make a great film another like another Josh Warrington uh, <laughs> uh, against the odds film maybe about uh, bringing the Grand Depart have you ever thought about a film well we did have some people approach us uh, afterwards to say could they uh, could they uh, try and turn it into a film um which they tried to do, and we never heard from them again. So uh, I think okay. that's maybe your answer, Gary. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> he also says, how much easier is his job with a Premier League Leeds United? Would, uh, how much easier would your job be with Premier League Leeds United? And he says, in brackets, and through gritted teeth, Huddersfield Town. <laughs> yeah, well, we, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, you know, clearly that would be a great thing for, for us. It would be a, uh, certainly a big help. Uh, you know, we'd love lots of the Yorkshire teams to do well. You know, i fed up with people on the, in the dark side over in Lancashire saying and Manchester saying to us, you know, why haven't you got any premiership teams in Yorkshire? Well, if you remember going back to the top flight, I don't know, 20 years ago, they were all over here and not yeah. over there. So, you know, people have short memories to... So hopefully the uh, the pendulum will swing back our way and we can get some some other Yorkshire teams, not just Leeds up in there, up in the top flight. And then we can have some really good local derbies. Yeah, for sure. Fabulous. Yeah. Uh, that's it for LS11 for this week. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ryan, once yep, again. You, Ryan. Uh, uh, and, of course, Sir Gary Verity. Thank you so much for spending some time with us this morning. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you. you Thanks very much. Sir Gary. Thank you. Your midweek fix of Leeds United. It's LS11.